love the winds of the Spirit blowing before you walk up here. That's kind of a cool thing. Remember we did that because of Acts 2 when the Holy Spirit came? There was a sound of a mighty, mighty rushing wind when he came. And this whole book, the book of Acts, is sometimes called the Acts of the Holy Spirit. And so we're, we're into that. And uh, I'm excited about spending some time this summer in the book of Acts. And uh, one of the cool things about the book of Acts, you know, if, if you've read through the Bible, you know that... Um, some of it is narrative, which means it's story. Some of it's poetry. Some of it's lists. Like, you know, Hababa 16 syllable name gave beget so and so, blah, 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 blah. And you kind of skip over those parts, you know, because they're hard to pronounce all those names. But, uh, but the really cool parts of scripture that I, I just love to read and fun to preach is the narrative, the story. And Acts is all story. And so it's a really, really fun book as well as. A powerful account of the early church and what they did. And because it's story, and we're in Acts chapter 5 today, I want to bring you up to speed. Because if you miss the first, you, you kind of feel like you're dropping in the middle of nowhere. Chapter 1, remember, we started. Jesus ascended. He appeared to his apostles and to his followers for 40 days and gave them many convincing proofs. Paul says he appeared to over 500 people at once. He ate with them. He hung with them. He gave them instructions. He said, you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. He said, but don't try it without the Holy Spirit. You wait for him. And so they went to that upper room and they waited. And they replaced Judas with Matthias. And they waited. In Acts chapter 2, that wind came. And the Spirit came and filled them up and gave them boldness. And they went out into the streets empowered by the Holy Spirit to speak boldly the gospel and not just to speak it but it was on the day of Pentecost when people from all over the world had come to Jerusalem to celebrate this festival and they were speaking the gospel in languages they'd never learned before and people were hearing it no matter what was being spoken in their own language it was amazing and 3,000 people came into the church on that day and last week we looked at chapters 3 and 4 Peter and John on their way to temple one day, remember they healed this lame man? And he got up off his mat and began to dance and praise God, and it drew a crowd. Peter preached the gospel again. 2,000 more people came into the church and believed. And that's when the religious leaders got upset. And Peter and John looked right in their eyes and said, Guys, we have to obey God, not man. We're going to hear that again today in a really strong way. They went back to the disciples said, we are so excited about what God is doing. More people are coming into the church. And they prayed for more boldness. And the chapter ended with a little account of a man named Barnabas. He was going to play a prominent role a little later down the road. But Barnabas did something that was amazing. He sold one of, I don't know if he had more than one property or what, but he sold a property that he had. And he brought it to the apostles, the price that he got for the property. And he set it at their feet. And he said, if there's anyone in the church that has a need, you take care of them. Isn't that an amazing thing? That he was led by God's Spirit to do that. And today we pick up with chapter 5, right after that account. And here's what it says. It's, you ever heard of Ananias and Sapphira? Okay, we're going to talk about them today. Ananias and Sapphira thought that was pretty cool what Barnabas did. It says, so, so a man named Ananias together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. And with his wife's full knowledge, that phrase is real important, she knows everything that's going on here, they kept back part of the money for himself, and then he brought the rest of it, and he put it at the apostles' feet, which in and of itself is not a problem at all. Peter's even going to say here in a minute, it's your money, you can do what you want with it. But what he did was he kind of grandstanded and he kind of tried to come off like, yeah, this is all the money we got for this property and, and almost like he wanted to look good. And that becomes really obvious as we go through this. In other words, he lies. Here's what it says. He brought the money, he put it at Peter's feet like it was all that they got. And Peter said to Ananias, how is it that Satan has filled your heart? Now, when I read the Bible, I like to pause and think about things because we don't talk like that, right? When's the last time one of your friends in Christ said, how is it that Satan has filled your heart? We don't say that, do we? That's powerful stuff. And this is Peter. This is a rock in the church that you have, and now listen to this, that you have lied to the Holy Spirit. Now, he's lied to the people 
But Peter says, you've also lied to the Holy Spirit. This is something that is really good and powerful for us to remember. There's no such thing as a private sin. And anytime we sin against anyone, the Bible says we're also sinning against God. Even if another person isn't involved, our sin is always an affront to God. Remember what Jesus said about doing good to people? Even if you just give a cup of cold water in my name, what you've done to the least of these, you've done for me. Right? Jesus is in that good act. Remember what Jesus said to, to uh, Saul before he changed his name to Paul when he was persecuting the church and Jesus interrupted his trip to Damascus and appeared to him in a bright light and he said, Saul, Saul, why? And I remember, Saul's going after the church. But Jesus said, why are you persecuting me? You see, whenever, whatever we do, Jesus takes it personally as well. And so uh, he says, why have you lied to the Holy Spirit? And you've kept back some of this money for yourself uh, that you received for the land. Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after you sold it, wasn't the money yours to do what you wanted to with? Of course, it was at your disposal. Uh, you, you didn't have to give it all. You could have said, hey, here's 50% of it. The rest of it we're putting on a, a lake cottage up here on the Sea of Galilee. It's going to be our little retirement place, right? You could have done that, and that would have been totally fine. But you had to come in here and kind of wave the flag and say, hey, look, I'm just like Barnabas. Look at this. Kind of wanting to be noticed. What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but you've lied to God. There's that truth again. So when Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. That's pretty strong, isn't it? I don't know that it gets any stronger than he fell down and died. And the next line, as you can imagine, is great fear seized the church in Jerusalem. Now, I want you to feel this. Can you imagine if we had uh, some kind of fundraiser, something going on, we're trying to raise money for the poor, and somebody came into our service here, and they laid the money here. Let's say we had a table, and I'm, I'm here, and they laid the money there on the table, and uh, they said, here, we sold a piece of property, and we want you, uh, the leaders of the church, to distribute this to everyone that has need. And I said to the person, how is it that Satan has filled your heart? Why did you lie to the Holy Spirit? And they dropped dead. Would that have an impact on us a little bit? <laughs> yeah, you probably never want to talk to me again, would you? <laughs> I'm like, you know, I'm really thankful that God never, he doesn't do this again later in history. But I'm telling you, he made his point pretty strong, didn't he? Uh, it, great fear grabbed the church. And these young men come in, they take him, and they, it's funny because we're not, it's, it's almost like these young men, they don't say anything, they're not recorded to say anything, they just come in and carry him out to bury him. Three hours later, Sapphira shows up, and Luke is very careful to tell us she doesn't know anything that's happened. And Peter says, hey, Sapphira, is this the price that you got for the land? Oh, yeah. Remember full knowledge? Oh, yeah, that's absolutely, that's what we got. And Peter said the same thing to, to you. How could you conspire against the Holy Spirit and do such a wicked thing? The men who just buried your husband, that probably got our attention, are coming back in and they're going to bury you too. And she fell down and died. Whoa. You know what that passage made me think about? There's a little doctrine that we call the omnipresence of God. That he's everywhere. That he's everywhere. And I'm not sure that I really live like I believe that all the time. Sometimes when I'm all by myself, I think, it's a little easier to th do things maybe, isn't it? Nobody's going to see. But if I really believed that I'm never alone, if I really believed what I say that I believe about God, that He is indeed everywhere, would that have an impact on where I go on my computer when no one else is in the room? Would that have an impact on the words that I speak around people who don't know Jesus when I'm hanging around with those folks and the words that would come out of my mouth? If I knew that God was there and I really believed it, 
How many of you have ever had this experience? I, maybe it's just a pastor thing, but I've had this experience. People have come here, you know, this is kind of like, this is kind of like where I, I kind of almost live like here in this building in some ways, you know, I'm like here all the time. And people will come in and I've had people do this and, and they'll, they'll be talking to me and something will slip out, a word. Oh, I'm sorry. I shouldn't say that in church. And I'm like, dude, he's out there too. Do you, do you think that God only lives in this building in, North, in Bay City? You know what I'm saying? But, but don't we do that? Have you not heard things like that? You know, this is a powerful lesson for us to draw from this text. That, that Ananias thinking, hey, we're, nobody knows. It, it, it's cool. It, it, you know, we'll just conspire to ourselves and we'll keep this money back and we'll look good. Friends, God is everywhere. And we really need to consider that and be aware of that in our life. Everywhere we are. Not just out of fear, but out of reverence. Out of respect, out of awe, out of love. One other lesson that, that we need to pull up here before we leave this part of the story. Integrity and authenticity are indispensable to the gospel. You know what authenticity is? Being real, not being fake. The opposite of hypocrisy. Uh, integrity and, and authenticity are, are, are indispensable to God, to our walk with God, and to the gospel. You see, when you come to know Christ, hopefully you understood that you're not saved because of your good works, but you're saved because of the cross and the blood of Jesus. And you're made new, and that same Holy Spirit that, that blew and filled the apostles has now come to live within you. And the purpose of that Holy Spirit is manyfold. Yes, to give you joy. Yes, to give you hope. Yes, to encourage you when you're down. All of those things. But ultimately, all of it is to make you more and more and more and more and more into the likeness of Jesus. Why? Not just for you. For the glory of the Father. And for the credibility of the gospel. Because when people who claim to have been born again and changed by Jesus Christ live just like people who haven't, it guts the credibility of the gospel. And that's what God is really dealing with at the core here. He's saying, no, 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 no. In the birth, and the very beginning stages of the church, we're not going to have lies and masquerades and, and, and you know, uh, facades being played in the church. We're going to understand that our word is our bond and that what we say is true. And they, we need to know that. And so Ananias and Sapphira become a really powerful illustration of the fact that honesty and integrity and authenticity matter to the gospel. That's a big deal. Wow. The next section then in my Bible says the apostles heal many people. This is amazing. Now, there are nearly 5,000 people in the church at this point, but Luke makes it real clear that the apostles have been given abilities that are special and that actually exceed those of, of the other 5,000. That they, they can lay their hands on people and, and, and give the gift of the Holy Spirit. They, they have these abilities to heal, and all of it is for the establishment of the church and the credibility of the gospel. And so the apostles are doing many signs and many wonders. And they met in this place called Solomon's Colonnade, which is a giant porch that's like, a, like with pillars and an open air space in the temple. And Luke says that no one dared to join them, even though they were highly regarded by all. That is powerful to me. They're like, mm. I, I mean, maybe it was awe. Maybe it was, man, did you hear what happened to Ananias? Maybe, you know, who, who knows the reasons, but there's like this really respect thing. They're like, we really regard those people highly, but I'm not sure I want to go right now in there. Nevertheless, Luke says, many more people believed in Jesus and were added to their number. The people brought their sick to them and laid them in the streets, Luke says, and they laid them in the streets just hoping. This is how incredible this, this movement was. They laid them in the streets just hoping that Peter's shadow would maybe touch their sick person and heal them. People from towns all around Jerusalem brought their sick and those tormented by evil spirits. And the Bible says all of them were healed. Wonderful. I mean, God is moving in this powerful way. And so naturally, the next section is labeled the apostles face persecution. 
God is moving, and now the enemies are going to begin to push back, and it's the religious leaders. And there's a theme throughout not just the book of Acts, but the whole Bible, that religiosity, which is the antithesis of what God calls us to. Religiosity is, I do this, I, I, and I, don't def- I don't ever detour, this is the way we always do it, and these are the rules, and we keep the rules, and we keep the days, and we do it this way, and you know, it's just this religiosity thing. God is like, that is not what I'm about. I mean, he, he says, I'm, I'm sick to death of your sacrifices. I want your heart. You come close to me with your lips, but your heart is far from me, you know? Those are the words of our, of our God. I want your heart. I want to know you. But here we see that just like throughout the rest of the Bible, the religious spirit is the spirit that combats the work of God. It wasn't the world that killed Jesus. It was the religious establishment that pulled the trigger and pushed back and said, No! You're messing with our stuff, man. You're messing with our plan. We had it all in a nice, neat box, and you're stirring it all up. Now you're letting those people in. What are you doing? And it's exactly what they're facing here. In verse 17, it said, Then the high priest and all of his associates, who were members of the party of the Sadducees, I always feel the need to say this, there were three or four major religious parties. that We know about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. There was a group called the Essenes and a couple other groups. But the Pharisees and the Sadducees were the two big ones. And the Sadducees were the priests. They ran the temple. That's a giant deal if you're a Jew because you can't do sacrifice without priests. And you can't do a lot of your worship without what happens in the temple. And the Sadducees were over all of that. Now, ironically, the Sadducees in this day, they just weren't any fun at all, man. Um, they didn't really even believe in much spiritually. They believed in the law. That's about it. They didn't believe in miracles. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in life after death. I mean, what do they believe in? They believe in the rules. And that's kind of where they are. And that's why I've always remembered, it's easy to remember what they were about because they were sad, you see. (laughs) That's why I always call them the sad, you sees. But they were filled not with awe. Wow, look what God's doing. This is so cool. No, they were filled with jealousy, Luke says. Which tells you right then, they're not worried about what's right and what's wrong and what honors God. This, these guys are messing with their turf. These guys are taking credit away from them, attention away from them. And so they arrested the apostles and they put them in the public jail. But during the night, listen to this, I love this. But during the night, the angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Guys, there's nothing the world can put you in that God can't take you out of. There's no bondage that can come against you that God can't set you free from. Nothing. Well, put them in jail. The angel said, okay, I'll lead you out of jail. And then there's a really cool lesson here. Go, the angel said, when he set them free, he said, go stand in the temple courts. And tell the people about this new life. You're never set free from bondage by Jesus without a mission. See, the gospel isn't, it doesn't end with us. The universe doesn't revolve around our happiness and and, and feeling good. We're set free for a purpose. We're brought into God's army, God's people. God's mission. We're called to be ambassadors. We're called out of that bondage, whether it's a jail cell or our old life or whatever, with a mission to go tell the people about this new life. In this verse, they're they're called to go into the temple courts, which is where everybody's going to be. In our case, it's wherever we go, where we work, where we live, where we hang out, to tell people about this new life. Hey, I can tell you about my old life, and I can tell you what happened when I came to know Jesus and how all of that changed when I repented and the Holy Spirit took up residence in my life. Let me tell you about the new life now that I know Jesus. Let me tell you about hope and joy and times that I've been really down and really hurting and how God lifted me up and used even bad things in my life for good. Just our testimony. And so they go to this place at daybreak. They stand in the temple courts and they begin to share this good news. The next morning, the high priest and his associates arrived at their meeting place. Remember, because they put him in jail, they think they're still there. 
And they call together the Sanhedrin, which is all of the religious groups, all of the bigwigs in one giant room. And they're going to call in the apostles. They sent to the jail for the apostles. But when they got there, I love this. They found the, the cells with the doors closed and the guards are still standing by the doors. But there's nobody home. It's like God led them out and didn't, they didn't even know what happened. God can do anything. I love it. They're like, oh yeah, we'll get them for you. Wait a minute. Is that, that, I just love that. <laughs> and when they get that report that they're gone, the religious leaders have no idea what to do. They're dumbfounded. Verse 25. And then somebody came into this room where the Sanhedrin was meeting and they said, Hey, look, the men that you put in jail are standing in the temple and they're teaching the people. And at that, the captain went with his officers and he brought the apostles in. They did not use force because they were afraid that the people might stone them. It's all about politics with these guys. And the apostles were brought and they were made to appear before the Sanhedrin again. Congress, giant, huge, intimidating group to be questioned by the high muckety-muck. Sorry, I should be more respectful, shouldn't I? The high priest. But that was kind of his attitude. He just thought he was all that. He really did. Uh, and here's what it says. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said. And yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you're determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Well, they were guilty of this man's blood. But they're not going to go there. They got it all rationalized in their mind. They know why they did it, and it was for this good and this reason. And You ever heard people talk, and it's like, I'm not even sure what you're saying is connected with reality, but you believe it. I mean, they had this thing all rationalized, and they thought, you know, no, we know why we did this. And Peter and the other apostles replied, Annas, we must obey God rather than human beings. we got to obey God. We, we, uh, you can tell us not to do yet whatever till the cows come home. We're going to obey Jesus. And he goes on and he says, The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging on a cross. God raised him to his own right hand. You know what Peter's saying there to the high priest? You've been replaced, buddy. Jesus is now the once for all high priest. Jesus is our great high priest. A priest is an intercessor. A priest is someone who makes sacrifices on behalf of the people and intercedes for the people between the people and God. Jesus is all of that. Jesus was the Lamb of God. He laid his own blood on the altar once for all, for all who will believe. And he now sits at the hand, right hand of his Father to intercede 24 hours a day, seven days a week, for all of eternity, for all who call on the Father through faith in Jesus. That's awesome. I don't know if Annas got the message, but that's what he's saying. He's been exalted to the right hand of the Father. And now as the Prince and as the Savior, that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgiveness of their sins. You know, this all sometimes sounds harsh, but the whole motive of, of God is to bring us home, is to bring us back to him. That's his one motivation. That's his one desire. He's like, look, sometimes even when I say things and do things that seem harsh, it's all about wanting to deliver you from the things that are breaking you and destroying you so that you can come and receive forgiveness and refresh, refreshment. God, this is so powerful. This is a truth that's just been stirred up in my heart for a few months now. And it, I, I just think it just needs to be lifted up loud. God can forgive any sin as long as we can repent. God does not forgive sin that is not repented of. That's why pride is the ultimate enemy of faith. We have to confess. We have to have a humble heart. 
And that's the religious leader's problem. They're too proud to confess their sin. Uh, We are witnesses of this, Peter said. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey Him. And when they heard this, when the religious leaders heard this, they fell to their knees and they said, what must we do to be saved? Just like the people in Acts 2, right? Yeah. No, the only thing they did was get mad. And this is what happens when people experience conviction. They either get defensive. Who are you? Who do you think you are? Yada, yada, yada. Or they get humble. And the religious leaders get furious. And they want to kill them. They want to put them to death. But at that moment, a Pharisee who was very respected, I'm absolutely convinced that God had this orchestrated for this guy to be there on this day. His name was Gamaliel. And he was a respected Pharisee and a teacher of the word. And and he began to speak as a voice of reason. And he said, hey, put these guys outside for a minute. Let me talk to you just for a second. And he began to give the Sanhedrin a history lesson on uprisings and stirrings like this. He said, this has happened before. There have been a lot of people who've raised up and they've even claimed to be doing it in the name of God. With some great cause, some great, you know, purpose. And people would rally to them and sometimes we felt threatened by them in the past. But you know what? They've all fizzled out. And so he said in verse 38, Therefore in this present case, I advise you to leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose and their activity is of merely human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. And that's true. And that's what they were doing, actually. And his voice of wisdom touched them and made some headway with them. And it says his speech persuaded them. And so they called called the apostles in and they had them flogged. And I don't want to just look over that because that means they beat them with whips. Okay? This wasn't just a, don't do that anymore. This was they beat them with whips. This is really, really painful bad. And then they ordered them not to speak in this name or in the name of Jesus and they let them go. They're doing everything they can to do exactly what the enemy does, friends. The same spirit is in this world. They cannot do anything to stop these guys, but they're doing everything they can to intimidate them and to make them afraid to speak. And that's what the enemy does. He tries to intimidate and to to stop us with fear. And so the apostles left the Sanhedrin cowing and afraid. Okay, I guess we won't speak in the name of Jesus anymore. No. They left the Sanhedrin rejoicing. When's the last time you were beaten with whips and walked out going, yes! (laughs) That's where these guys are. This is awesome. I had a little tiny taste of this, not with whips. Not with whips, man. These guys got me beat big time. But I got this one memory that comes up in my mind every time I read this passage. 1987, I went out to Wichita to live with my family. I was raw. I was fresh. I was brand new in Jesus. I'd just given my heart to the Lord a few weeks before this. 20 years old. And um, they have this thing called the River Festival in Wichita. And there's like, you know, a couple hundred thousand people that come. Jazz, music. It's similar to some things maybe we have have had around here at the band shell and, and the brats and all the good smells in the air and all that stuff and a lot of alcohol. So we decided we were going to go down there and, and, and we were going to put this music thing together and this mime and we were going to tell people about Jesus and, and, uh, and we, it made a lot of noise and, and it, it presented just the message of Jesus. And there's this one place where uh, by, the, by the water, there were these two concrete structures that were built that went out over this pool. 
and then it was designed for the water to be a waterfall falling into this huge pool with a fountain in the middle. And then below that, cascading down to the river were all these people. But the water wasn't there. It was dried up. So we thought, thank you, God. You just gave us this awesome stage. So we just got out there on this thing in front of everybody, and we're doing our thing. And, and all of a sudden, these, these people, they started to like, you bunch of... Rah, rah. I can't say what they said, but it was like, it was basically a very unpolite way of saying, would you please stop and leave? Okay? Now, all kinds of words. And we felt a little threatened and, and those kind of things, and so we, we walked away. But as we were walking away, we thought of this verse, and we thought, yes, we got yelled at for Jesus. <laughs> I mean, it was really minor. But it is a privilege to take heat for Jesus. That's what they're saying. It says, they walked away from the Sanhedrin uh, rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Wow. Oh, the, wh- how we could just, how the world would be turned upside down if we just were filled with that mindset. Day after day. Now listen, here's the end result of all of this. Day after day, in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. Never. They just kept going. You know, I thought, as soon as I read that, that's the end of the chapter. When I, when I read that, I thought about Acts chapter 1. And how important it was for them to have seen Jesus alive. And for him to say to them, hey, I've been on the other side. I've been to death. And I've come back. And I'm here to tell you, don't be afraid. There's nothing, afraid of, there's nothing to be afraid of on the other side. And you know, I've said, I said it that week, I'll say it this week. When you're ready to die, nobody can stop you. If you're ready to say, hey, if that's what it comes to, I mean, I'm not planning to, to go down that road today, but if that's what it comes to, then all right, bring it on. It's pretty hard to stop somebody like that. And, and so this thing is just exploding because they are filled with such boldness. It's just a beautiful testimony for us to see the early church working like this. So how do spiritually hungry disciples respond? Well, hopefully we're inspired. Hopefully we're encouraged to want to be less afraid and more bold like that. Hopefully we're persuaded to have a a shift and to begin to view life the way they did. That, hey, you know what? This life, uh, for some reason, a little plaque in grandma's kitchen just popped into my mind. said, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Isn't it funny how you never forget some things like that? That's the mindset they lived with. It's all about the kingdom, man. It's all about what I do here for my king. Uh, and that's what my life's about, helping more come to know the king. I hope that we're inspired today and challenged with the value of the integrity and the authenticity of our life and how important that is. In terms of our lifestyle, the words that we speak, the way we conduct ourselves to the credibility of the gospel. Powerful, powerful. And if there's anyone here today and you're thinking, I don't know that I know that I know that I have that living Jesus Christ in my heart. I want to know him. Don't be like the religious leaders and resist. Be humble. And open up your heart and say, Lord, come into my life. I do turn away from my old life. And I ask you to come in and be my Savior and my King. And come today. Let me pray with you. Because God has just got a boatload of grace. He'd just love to pour all over you.